Hey, it's Talknosis, and we've got an extra special, super awesome, I'm going to say special a couple more times, <laughs> guest. <laughs> it's it's Bee Skolnick, you know her as uh, one of the hosts. Um, and uh, and hey, it's Jason. But, uh, you know, Bee's got a brand new book that just came out, I think, literally yesterday. Um, definitely a, a show that we, we are not uh, uh, neglectful about, that we definitely shouldn't have done a long time ago. And a book <laughs> Of both Jason and I have read. Um, we're going to read it. Do you do you, do you narrate the audiobook, by the way? I do narrate the audio. Yeah, book. it's just you know you got such a great voice, you got such a great presence, so that's probably how I'll read it because there's so many books, B. There's so many books, but we are talking about books. the Witch's Book of Numbers, enhance your magic with numerology. We're always telling you, hey, I, I just said there's too many books. I haven't read this one yet, but I'm going to. I actually do have the audio book loaded up. You know, it's if I read it before the show, like then you know that's boring, right? Because I want to learn about it from you, right from the source. Yeah, um, you got to get a primer for it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, we're always interviewing people about books on the show, and people out there listening, watching. You can only read. You only have so much time. You can only read so many books. But stop what you're doing. Go out and buy this one, right? Or get it as an audiobook. Um, so we'll just dive right into it. Oh wait, we won't dive right into it because uh, the we'll start off with a plug uh rebecca skolnick.com if you go there she has a link uh there's also rebecca skolnick.com slash the uh, uh dash witches dash book dash of dash numbers but if you just go to rebecca skolnick.com uh you can get it there um so it'll be very obvious i promise yeah. you yeah yeah <laughs> Let's, so, let's do a quick aside here and wonder how often anybody has ever stopped to type in a URL based on what they're hearing in a podcast. Like, has this anybody ever? The, went to like, this might be the first time because exactly. everybody listening and watching are like, "Wait, they're hitting pause, they're typing that in, they're putting in the yeah. dash." If I had a nickel for every time I've said, "I'll link it in the show notes," I could produce my own <laughs> podcast forever. Yeah, exactly. no, I, I, I'd, I'd be rich. But uh, you know what? <laughs> We're going to link it in the show notes. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Good and time. also, as my publisher would remind you, uh, book sales are a marathon, not a sprint. So any timing is good timing to talk about a book. It's out there. It's living its own life. And uh, it's about as old as your baby now. Yeah. <laughs> so you've had good reason to be a little busy. Yeah. And, nice. You know, uh, to, to that point, too, we don't know when people are going to be listening to this. People oh, might be exactly. going through our back episodes after finding us 10 years from now, and then they're going to be like, oh, hey, I'm going to find this book. There you go. Yeah, mm. someone reached out to me from Ireland and said they found my book in a bookstore there, and I had no idea that it was even available overseas, <laughs> let alone actually <laughs> being carried in bookstores. So I have no idea what this book is doing or when. Um, so perfect timing. Excellent. So Excellent. Let's start start with an easy question. Hey, B, what is numerology? I like this question. So <laughs> numerology, the way that I define numerology is a bit of a twofold practice. So on the one hand, numerology is the ancient, and you can put quotes around the word ancient since uh, we know that most of what we refer to as ancient is, is pretty recent in, in terms of time and history. Um, but it's the study of the divine language of numbers. So uh, back when the Greeks and the Egyptians were all um, playing around in their own sandboxes, there was very little separation between the mystical and the practical. You could go to school and learn to be both a scientist and a priest in the same kind of curriculum. And so numbers were obviously seen as uh, in mathematics and as scientific tools, but they also had this divine code that mystics loved to dig into. And they saw it as the language with which that which they called God wrote the world or the universe. And so getting to know this code and getting to know this language brought them into deeper connection with the divine so on the one hand, it's the study. You can actually study these numbers. You can work with them and learn their energies. And then the second part is the intuitive application of that information onto people, places, or collective events. So if you are interested in astrology or any of those um, other archonic <laughs> tools, 
<laughs> um, <laughs> tongue in cheek, arconic tools. Um, just like everyone has their own kind of unique natal or astrology chart, everyone also has their own unique numerology chart. So the book goes into both kind of the practice of numerology as a whole and a lot of information and ways to use the numbers, but it also teaches you, which I know we're going to talk about in a little bit, how to find out some numbers that are at you, your core, your personal core, and then how you can use that information to further understand yourself. Cool. And then, mm. how did you get into it? Numerology was actually one of the first kind of witchy practices that I got into. Um, my mom had my chart done by a sidewalk mystic in Northern California who's still there. He just sits on the sidewalk with a little sign that says, like, let me do your numbers. And, um, and it was awesome. And I thought it was so interesting. And the book actually starts with a story of me getting in a fight with my mom over needing to go to tutoring uh, for algebra two. So I'm very <laughs> upfront with the fact that the idea that I'm teaching anyone anything to do with numbers is a huge cosmic joke. And so if I can do it, you can do it as well. Um, but it really kind of was the first time that I saw numbers as anything other than like scary mathematics that I didn't understand. And so I personally was just really interested in how how I could use them differently or what other kind of angles I could I could see them through other lenses. And so the book is really kind of a collection of a decade of study uh, as both of you read it and whoever is listening, you'll find that it's about much, much more than numerology and that a lot of these kind of esoteric or mystical tools really do speak with one another. And so I've given you tarot associations and astrology associations. Um, all of the numbers have their own chapters full of myth and legend and historical figures. So it's it's a fun kind of mishmash um, of a lot of things. Yeah. Mm. It- can you tell us like uh, like about the book, like how it came to be about and, you know, why you wrote it, like the, the motivation? Yeah. So in the pandemic, really, kind of in 2020, when it all started, I had been I've been reading tarot personally for almost 15 years now, which is a crazy number that I don't want to think about, <laughs> um, <laughs> but kind of not, not professionally, but I was being more open about it. And for a while I had an Instagram. And so uh, a lot of people knew that that was part of my life and my practice. And so when the pandemic started, um, I started doing collective tarot readings on my Instagram and kind of started to find other like-minded individuals who were um, running tarot accounts or talking about things. And then kind of witchcraft or spirituality as a whole, but really witchcraft became like really trendy, really fast. And so everyone was kind of talking about it. And I realized that I had all this information about numerology, but I didn't see it really being spoken about at all. And so there was like a little bit of a strategic niche where I was like, okay, if I'm talking about this, that has to do with these other things, uh, then maybe that will help me to uh, n- not break through, but you know, it's something different on the scene a little bit, um, just to be transparent. And people were really interested in the information. So I started teaching classes. I wrote a little zine online that I gave away for free for anybody mm. who wanted to uh, learn more. I started working with clients, doing chart readings, you know, uh, calculating people's personal and personal numerology charts and like digging into it with them. Uh, and then I do have to say it was a little bit of a magical moment. Um, A publisher actually reached out to me and asked me if there was a book project in this work. And uh, I'm a fan of saying yes and learning how to do things later. (laughs) So um, we took about three or four months going back and forth, kind of getting this proposal together because a, a lot of nonfiction you can sell on just a proposal, but that usually is done by the author or by the author and their representation before it goes to publishers. Uh, so it was a little non-traditional in that I did that whole process with them. Uh, so it was very important to them that witchcraft 
play a very active role in which it hadn't in my in my work before just in terms of I had the classes I was teaching had not married the two topics um, but they really wanted to talk about the intersection between witchcraft and numerology so it grew from there and now every number has spells or rituals that I have um, either created or adapted or borrowed and, you know, with credit, obviously. And so with each number, there are many, many ways to get witchy with it as well, if that's something you're interested in. Mm. Uh, so before I, before I barrel on with the, uh, the question sheet, do you have anything to, to, to add, to ask, to interject, to threads to pull on? You, well, uh, you know, maybe some of them might come up a little later. Um, uh, but I guess one thing that like, so this is a lot of stuff that you've pulled together um, mm. and like you've, you've threaded things through, like you've tried to kind of um, encapsulate like stuff that you've been thinking about for like a long time and also versus like over the pandemic, realizing there was an opportunity um, is uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll essentially ask one of one of the questions we've already set up, but then add to it is that like, um, like not all numerological systems are made to work together. Um, but so, <laughs> So how do you decide what to use? But also have you like, is the, have you kind of, has you, have you almost created like the Skolnick system here? Like uh, in terms of, in terms of an, like a possible approach for these intersecting systems? Uh, maybe one day we will, we'll just let the universe work on that one. No. So you're, you're absolutely right. Since it is still an, like a historical and present tense school of thought, uh, there are different numerological systems. Not all cultures use the same numbers and or um, number systems. So it is very important when you're approaching numerology that you at least understand what system you're working in. And then, of course, I I love to pick and choose, but I know some people don't and kind of frown on, on that behavior. So I offer a lot of different options, but the book and my, my practice is really based in Pythagorean numerology. So there, that obviously comes from Pythagoras, who was a Greek who studied in Egypt. And so a lot of, I, I'm very passionate about kind of reconnecting those lines of study as well, uh, because they have been erased historically. So, you know, the Greeks didn't just pop up and know all of this stuff. They learned it somewhere too. Um, so mine is Pythagorean or Greek numerology, which is still very much used uh, primarily in the Western world. But there's also Chaldean numerology, which is very different and only uses the numbers one, one through eight instead of Pythagorean uses zero through nine, like the building block numbers. Um, and then mm -hmm. you grow on that. And Chaldean numerology is still used today. I've read many books on it. And it's a really interesting system. It comes from Babylon. And then Chinese numerology is also very much practiced today. Uh, it was even on one of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills talked about Chinese numerology on her first episode a couple years ago, which I thought was very funny. Uh, mm. So there are absolutely different systems. And so I tell my students, and I I hope I say this in the book, um, but I tell my students that if you're out there Googling, you might find information that conflicts with what I'm sharing in the class. And that that just has to be OK, you know, since there are living, breathing systems. Um, so I just try and, and stick with my system as much as possible, like what's out there. And mm -hmm. but no, no Skolnick system yet. It's very much okay. Pythagoras. <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that was, that was me kind of segueing into your question, John, did you have anything else on that you wanted to ask about? No, no. So I was going to segue into the next question, which is what can numerology teach us about ourselves be? Yeah. So I know this is on the list too. Um, my kind of signature chart reading is called the significant six. It is, there's a whole chapter in the book that goes over the significant six and how to find it. And I see these as the six numbers that can really help to start to show you the snapshot of who you are or what has been like offered to you in this life. And it starts with three numbers, which I do cheekily refer to as the Holy Trinity. And um, it's your <laughs> life path number, your 
public persona number, and your yearly cycle number. And these are all calculated from your date of birth. So for example, the life path number is probably like the one number that if you're going to learn it, you know, definitely um, see what is in store for you there. And that is found by adding all of the digits of your birthday up until you get a single digit. So once you get to that double digit number, you just keep adding um, until you have one number. And so the life path number is like your zoomed out long game perspective of your life. So some folks might not connect with this number or its energy earlier on in their life because it definitely is something that you grow into. Um, But it's like, you know, what's the overall energy or flavor or archetype of um, what you're here to tussle with in the world? What are going to be your challenges, your areas of growth? Um, what maybe is energy that kind of comes easily to you and you're just not sure why or or what that could be about? It can also be used as a tool to help you really focus in. I mean, maybe you're feeling really lost and getting to know this life path number. You're like, oh, yeah, that really points to some skills or some characteristics that I've seen in myself. Um, Or maybe it's even like you can find, I I don't supply this, but you could find lists of possible jobs that would be good for someone, (laughs) you know, on a life path of of X. And so um, there are a lot of ways that you can can use this information. And the the Holy Trinity altogether, like the, the life path number is the long game, but then the yearly cycle is all the way zoomed in. So it's the month and the date of your birth plus mm. the year, like the current year. So you would add it this year when we're recording this to 2023. <laughs> um, if you're listening to this 10 years down the line in the vault, <laughs> use whatever year it is for you. <laughs> And that's kind of the zoomed in perspective Um, and kind of the cool like mathematical magic of numerology is that when you start doing some of these calculations, especially like yearly cycles, there is magic in the math. So you'll do the calculation. So I'll just use myself as an example. My birthday is July 7th. So seven, seven. And if I were to add that to 2023, I would get to 21 and then I would add two plus one equals three. So I'm in a three year currently. And if I do the math on either side of that three um, with other years, I'll see that it actually does work out that the years go up, you know, through the line, like one year one through year nine. And then the next one magically starts over again at one. So when you calculate your yearly cycles, you're actually calculating chunks or chapters of nine years of your life. It just works out that way. And then you can pull those nine year chapters out. And if you want to look at that story or kind of what, you know, Pythagoras has, um, has a tool, but there's also a modern tool that kind of looks at these larger chunks of life of like groupings of nine years. So it's really a a fun rabbit hole to go down. Mm. Um, And I guess to answer the original question of like, what can numerology tell you about yourself? uh, I think with any tool, it is just kind of interesting information that you then can work with and play with in whatever way brings you into deeper relationship with yourself or with like in the book with your magic or with your spirituality or with your God, if that's uh, of interest to you. And then it also has this very kind of practical temporal use of connecting you to like this current moment in time and space and like what energy is happening for you Mm. at any given day or year. Ah, that's interesting. Um, So the, the, this might be like you made a joke earlier about arconic uh, forces. And I think like it is actually like, you know, it's <laughs> we, we need to address the demiurge in the room, you know, like the uh, <laughs> <We do>. always. <laughs> and like uh, John and I just had a recorded a conversation where we were kind of discussing, um, you know, like a bit of that, the the trope of the world hating Gnostic, you know, um, and sometimes things like astrology and numerology um can feel like they're part of the world that we should be hating according to to some Gnostic interpretations. And so is there like a, um, uh, like I've got some ideas about how to thread the needle past that. I also have a very open definition of Gnosticism that doesn't require me to 
specifically hate things that come from the world per se. Um, but yeah, is there like a, do you have a way you, th- you needle or you thread that needle? Hmm. Um, I think my first one, and this is just kind of a personal, like personal ethical statement, I guess, is that yeah, yeah. I am never here to, imp- I- I'm here to share, I'm here to teach to a certain extent, I'm here to offer, um, but I'm not here to like talk anyone into anything or to kind of impress my views upon anyone. And so I think if you are not interested in working with systems like that, then that's fine. Um, But I, I, I think that it is an interesting dilemma because you can't really, like, I don't think you believe in astrology or you believe in numerology. It's like that they're both languages. They're both practices or arts that exist, whether or not you want to believe in them. And so, um, Yeah, I guess that's just where my brain went first is like, I'm just here to offer information. But I think that there are quotes from these thinkers who are way smarter than I will ever be, who used this information before it was kind of separated um, and subjugated by the church. There were these incredible mystics. I mean, Pythagoras, Plato, Kepler, um, all of these people who really saw these tools as getting them closer to understanding God or to understanding Mm. the divine. And so maybe that is also what someone would call the demiurge, like they were getting closer to the demiurge. Um, But I don't want to be that reductive. Like I want to believe that people who are fascinated in about how the world came to be, about how it functions, about what other mysteries and what other explanations might be like behind the veil, you know, so to speak. Uh, Mm -hmm. I just want to believe that they really did feel this information was helping them get closer to that. Totally. Like the, uh, um, on one hand, like I think your, your note about it's, these are things that exist, whether or not you're, you believe in them. I think that's that's a good way to put it. Like it's a, it's almost like, like you might be a world hating Gnostic, but if it's raining, you should still take an umbrella, you know? (laughs) Like, well, so my main thing about astrology, if and again, like I'm not interested in changing anyone's mind about mm. things, but I say like the moon controls the tides. And that is just a fact. We know that about this world, that the moon's movements control the ocean tides. And we are made of 80% water. So how dare we think that the moon would not have any kind of effect on us if it has effects on the oceans, which are much larger than us. So Again, I don't think you need to necessarily know the information or pay attention to the information if it goes against everything that you stand for. Um, but I do think it, it exists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious about your ideas, though, about threading the needle. John, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, not really. You know, it's uh, it's something that that I'm open to. Where, uh, like, uh, of course, you know, numerology. The numbers are an important aspect of understanding reality, right? And um, you know, there's a debate within mathematics: is is are, are numbers? It sounds like a very strange uh, uh, debate when, when you sort of uh, uh, phrase it. But is it, it, it are numbers something that the humans created to uh, for us to help understand uh, as a tool, or are numbers uh, like uh, programmed into reality, right? And there are scientists and physicists who make the argument that that math and numbers are programmed into reality itself. So I, um, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, understanding that um, you want to understand the reality that, that, that we live in. Um, and if you are some sort of world hating Gnostic, you know, you're, you're not going to escape the prison uh, without understanding how the, how the prison works, right? Like, you know, if you want to make a jailbreak, you, you, you know, you're, you're going to need a, a map, uh, uh, that said, you know the the world hating uh, Gnostic trope. I have some some issues with it, right? Um, May so, my book be your spoon to dig yourself out. <laughs> precisely, precisely. Um, and it actually it's a whole new marketing campaign. <laughs> to 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 my next question, which is you know this is something Jason and I have talked about a lot, where you know some of this esoteric stuff. Um, it, it's been explained to me as as a trick, 
for you to particularly so kind of capitalistic speculation, which we'll come back to. This is a trick for you to understand that, that everything is interconnected and you are interconnected, right? Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering if you can explain, B, you know, how numerology can help us understand how, how things are, are connected and how we are interconnected. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think I like the, I actually like the language of it's a trick because I do find it very funny that a part of this human experience does seem, I mean, obviously I don't have to say this to your audience, but does seem to be this ignorance or this forgetfulness that, you know, once we arrive here, we have forgotten everything that comes before. We don't see ourselves clearly in, in the, um, landscape of everything else. And so that our spiritual journey here is a lot of remembering what, who, and what we are. This is very Lion King now, but, um, (laughs) you know, kind of re-piecing all of this information together. And I think that numerology is really interesting because like you've already brought up, numbers, uh, aside from the debate, uh, they are used by kind of Every every person uses numbers to some extent, uh, whether that's just a, a handle on social media, if you throw some numbers, if it's just your birthday, if you're very into mathematics. I think numbers are kind of one of those truly universal systems that everyone touches at least once in their life, even if you speak different languages or um, to a certain extent, you know, you could use different numbers, but in in the present world, numbers have kind of they've they've systematically been agreed upon to a certain extent. Mm. Um, but I do find that in terms of more esoteric study, like the number energy, first of all, kind of feels at least for me and for a lot of people that I've worked with, there does seem to be this recognition that like, once you kind of get to know them, you're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, the things that I have been able, and I always use intuitive application when I talk about this, because I do use a lot of myself as my own channel. Um, I, the number of times I've said something to someone just based on a number and they've been like, how did you know that is kind of wild. Like there does seem to be this really mystical experience with numbers. Um, But then there is this through line between all of these other kind of esoteric systems. So uh, like if you're a Jesus fan, you can even kind of get into the numerology of (laughs) <laughs> yeah, love him. Um, of Jesus, like 33 is this master number yeah. that has been attributed to Jesus. But it's also like 33 um, is a huge number in Vedic religions, is a huge number in certain pantheons. Um, so you'll start to see that these numbers really do, it's like pattern recognition kind of in all of these mythological schools of thought. So I, mm. I don't exactly know how. I just know that the more I study it, the more it just seems to be all yeah. in all in the same soup. You know, mm. I, I have a question actually for both of you and uh, B, go first, because it's more for you. But it's, it's something that Jason and I talk a, a lot about. And sorry, I didn't uh, I didn't put it on the uh, on the sheet. But, you know, the things bubble up, even though this is this is a common refrain. So, you know, we. We, you know, we take our name, we look for patterns, we look at our birthdays, we, you know, we use numbers to understand, uh, have a deeper understanding of ourselves and reality. But I'm wondering, you know, I think of uh, numerology became and probably still is. I, I, I've been for my own sanity, not looking at it lately, but like QAnon, right? They got really into really elaborate numerology. So Unfortunately, you, they did. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's and when I say elaborate, I mean you know this is this puts Gematria or any other system to shame. So I, I'm wondering how. How do you have any advice for how we don't lose our minds, how we don't go insane, you know, uh, applying Mm. numerology to uh, 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 two things? Yeah, Uh, (laughs) I well, it's funny, right? Because, you know, like the tool, the tool is a tool. And then whoever is using the tool is going to bring themselves to the tool. And so. We don't get to say you don't get to use the tool. You, <laughs> um, so I, for my own sanity, have not gone down many of the QAnon numerological rabbit holes. Although I have read some information that I'm 
<laughs> it's like, oh, someone thought about that for a long time. Um, so I can't tell you whether or not I would actually like agree with anything that's coming out of uh, that line of thinking or, or what calculations they've done. Um, but I have to hold a very strong like foundation of this could be everything or it could be nothing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. think, I think I am very discerning when it comes to these spiritual tools. And I've had so many times when I've had my own, uh, where I've calculated my own numbers for something. And I'm like, either that doesn't resonate with me or I truly don't know what this is supposed to mean, you know, and then I put it down and maybe I'll never know. So mm. it's not, it's not a, a tried and true, I don't think, I think numerology is very much like astrology in that it's a contextual language that you have to speak, that it's not just like, oh, the number four means this. And so therefore you are that. Um, it's very much like here are the energies that four speaks to, here are the topics or the themes and how do those present in your life? So it very much like is a conversation um, that really heavily relies on context. And so to go back to the QAnon, you know, that's not a context that I'm interested in seeing the world through. And so I don't know how much that would resonate with me. Um but I also, I, I don't know. I mean, it gets very national treasure for me. If anyone's seen that Nicolas Cage movie, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> where there is the secret code. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that there, I'm very fascinated by gematria in when it's used in religious contexts to try and decipher like secret messages within a, a holy text uh, I'm very fascinated in that, but I can't say that I've done any of that or seen any success with that by myself. Yeah. Uh, Jason, there do you is... have any, any thoughts on that topic? Oh, sorry. You're already talking. Good. Yeah. No, no, that's great. Yeah. I, um, um, yeah, like I, I, I agree with everything that B is saying there. There's like a, a few thoughts that came to mind. Like I, I joked earlier that like, um, you know, the, the systems exist, whether or not you believe in them. So it's like a sense of the, um, you know, if it's raining, you're, you should probably take an umbrella, whether or not you believe in the rain, you know? <laughs> um, but, but the other part of that is that with weather reports, it's always a chance of rain. Like they can never define definitively say 100%. It's going to happen. This is going to happen in this place this way. Um, and I think that's a useful way to talk about it because, uh, like kind of to your point B, like say four generally means this, but it doesn't always mean this to everybody the exact same way you know that's kind of it's it's like it's the chance of rain not the exact prediction of rain you know hmm. um that's kind of a like a way to say it there and then like the other thing is um when it comes to a lot of this stuff like i people have probably heard me talk on the show before about like a lot of my approach to gnosticism is about experiencing about trying to experience an ineffable thing and then trying to F the ineffable <laughs> to like <laughs> to it to verbally and contextually express something that defies expression. Um, and I think like numerology, astrology, uh, like, you know, like Christianity, all of these are like have been attempts that have to express these things. And all of them are going to be insufficient in the sense that they can that they they are trying to express an inexpressible, you know, they're mm -hmm. always going to be lacking something um uh so where that kind of goes to for me with most systems is not is it true but is it useful you know um is it helping me is it helping others is it helping and by helping i don't just mean like validating what i want to be true but like you know making sure i'm living a healthy life that i'm remaining connected with my family and friends that I'm connected with my community, like versus being say disconnected, held away, closed away. Um, and that becomes, I think a useful rubric for most systems, including like QAnon, like, you know, kind of going like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe you've proved whatever it is you think you've proved, but that, that proof has means that I have to stop talking to my friends and I have mm -hmm. to stop, you know, shopping at a certain store or, or whatever. Like, these feel like disconnections. And so then that makes it less useful. 
you know? Um, but, uh, and I think like the other thing, like even Dramatria, like I, I'm, uh, this might annoy some of the Thelemites who may listen to this, but like one of the things that annoys me when reading like Aleister Crowley stuff is that he'll often be like, well, here's this incredibly interesting theory and I've proved it by using Dramatria on these words or these names of these places I went to when I did this thing. And so therefore, and I'm like, you know, I was with you right up until that, like I was with you right up until that was your proof, like, or that's your underlying reason why it's true. And I was just like, it could have been true or it could have been useful on its own, you know, <laughs> before you proved it, if that makes sense. And so I think that's uh maybe if there's a, an archonic side of any of this, it's the assumption that because it's numbers, it can be proved if that makes mm -hmm. has to be true. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's a, r a rambling way around what you were asking there, John. No, no, it's great. This is the ramble show. We encourage rambling. So, um, <laughs> yeah, have you heard anything I've said already? I think you're fine. <laughs> uh, hey, B, what's a, what's a magic square? <laughs> oh my gosh. The magic square is actually really cool. So the magic square is a tool. So under the umbrella of numerology, there's all these different ways that you can use it and different um, tips and tricks. And so the magic square is a Pythagorean tool that was actually, um, if you want to talk about something that you can't explain or can't prove, this idea of magical squares or mathematical squares. So I should back up. The magic square, if you're just looking at it, is a three by three square. So nine total boxes. And if you filled it in completely from bottom to top, it would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it gets all of your building block integers in there. And so this, the idea of a square that is filled with numbers, um, and all can be calculated in these cool and crazy ways was actually something that popped up in many regions of the world kind of around the same time. So there's no real way to know which one came first or what was informed by what. Um, but we do know from other accounts that like ideas will pop up or you'll see the same movies come out in the same year, you know. So I love kind of the magic of of where this inspiration came from. Um, so you can do a lot of, I, I put some of it in the book and then you can do more research on kind of magical squares as a whole. But the magic square that I teach in the book is a Pythagorean tool that you put the digits of your birthday into the square. So for example, my birthday of seven, seven, I would just have two sevens down um, in the bottom of bottom right hand corner of my square. Um, and then I would put in the year. So you just account for each digit of your birthday kind of within the square. And then the square can be read in many different ways. It can be read in um, columns, like one, two, three, that is the column of thoughts. It's a very individual column. It's like, you know, one being I, I think, then two being I'm connecting my dots. And then three is maybe I'll speak it aloud or I'll write it down or I'll share it with someone. So this shows like a thought process. Um, four, five, six being this um, column of will, you know, what do I do then after my thought? How do I put that into action? Um, how am I being, how are my ideas being tested or tried? How am I kind of reorganizing my thoughts. And then finally, that third column of 789 is action, then like, how do I put that um, out into the world? So we're building through um, the story one through nine, going from like a very individual experience to nine being a very collective experience, um, or one being the start and nine being the end. You can also read it as rows, and that's actually like quality of energy. So there's mental numbers, there's emotional numbers, there's um, practical numbers. You can read the Pythagorean arrows, which means once you fill in your square, if you have any completed rows or columns where you have all the numbers accounted for, that that means different things. So I take you through all of those. Um but I also find that kind of what the square offers you um, is a different way of looking at groupings of numbers. So even if you're taking it kind of outside of yourself, um, like I, 
I like to look at magic squares whenever I have like a couple or collaborators or someone asking about some kind of compatibility or collaboration because the number energies, it's like if you have a person who's all their numbers are up in their mind and they're very logical and they're coming to everything um, using their intelligence or their smarts and saying, this is what I think about this. But then they're working with someone whose numbers are all in the body and they feel very intensely and they're like, I don't know, that doesn't feel right. Or like, this is what feels good to me. Um, then that's just a different way of approaching like the same task. And so I find that it can create understanding where if I have this notion or this, this knowledge that, oh, I process things very emotionally, but Jason processes things very logically. Then when we come up to a struggle or a, an issue, then it's like, oh, right. Cause yeah, he thinks about things differently than I do. So yeah, I think it's just, again, these tools that can really help us to understand not only ourselves, but then we can gain insights into our relationships with others and how we might come to them a little easier um, hmm. based on that information. Cool. Very cool. Um, and, and so, already... oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if I, if I fill all of my numbers in the magic square, does that mean I achieve gnosis? <laughs> well, um, there are very few birthdays we'll, that will incorporate every single number in the square. So, <laughs> so the idea, no. Um, <laughs> I know, right? And like, how can I? How can we achieve gnosis through through numerology? Um, that would be a, a good question for a smarter mind than mine. <laughs> um, are, are there other numerological uh, practices in the book that we, that we haven't talked about? It's a good question. Oh my gosh! Um, I take you through the significant six. That's all about you. And the other three numbers that we didn't talk about. You know, there's the Holy Trinity that comes yeah. from the birthday. The other three numbers come from your name. So that is a more uh, like gematria, like um, I use the Pythagorean alphabet. It's very easy. A is one, B is two, C is three. When you get to I is nine, you start back over at one, one J is one, so on and so forth. Um, it's mm. in the book. Don't worry. And <laughs> um, I think names are really interesting because you'll find a lot of kind of traditional numerologists who will say it has to be the birth name. But I think that's really boring in 2023. And so I really uh, impress upon my clients that I want them to come to this using the name that they want to explore. And actually, mm. I know a Chaldean numerologist, so not the same system, but does incredible work. Her name is Novali Wilder. And she, her one of her main um, practices is name numerology. So she helps people naming to name things, whether that's people, pets, businesses themselves, you know, or if they want to change their name, kind of looking at the original name numerology and then um, what it would, what it would change into the name that they want to take on. And so I love that practice. So I think you're, if you're going to use your birth name, that's your inherited blueprint, right? It's what somebody else gave to you or put on you. Um, and then if you're using a name of your choice, it's it can be really empowering to say, this is the name that I chose for myself. And these are the energies it represents. And I, I wasn't even aware of that, but how cool that, that that's kind of what I offered this new sense of self. So I think name numbers are very cool. Um, other than that, Yes. So I take you through each number and each number has its own rituals, spells, and practices that uh, if you want to get witchy with it, there are tons of different kinds of spells. There's also um, more just spiritual experiences like automatic writing is not mm. necessarily a spell, but it is a practice that you can try. Um, mm. And um, which or channeled writing. That's kind of the the idea of allowing somebody else to be the pen or something else to be the pen. Uh, and then after that, um, I go through the magic square as a tool. And then I go through um, a lot of everyday magic. So how you can use numerology in the kitchen, how you can use it um, when you're brushing your teeth at night, how you can <laughs> use it to make coffee, to plan things. You know, there are numerological associations with all the days of the week. Um, there are even hourly things if you want to get really wild with it. Um, <laughs> but it can be really practical for planning. Like if you, three is the number of communication. So you know that you want to do a lot of writing or that you have to give a speech one day, maybe pick a day, you know, if it's in your control, 
pick a day with a heavy three energy, you'll kind of get like that universal boost. So I think there's a lot in there that um, mm. people can use in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're, we're just about ready to, to wrap up. Uh, Jason, do you have any closing questions or, or threads you want to pull on? Yeah. Well, so like you, you uh, mentioned this earlier about the other, like there's other traditions, there's other traditions that are active, like the Chaldean and um, the, uh, the like Chinese numerology um, is uh, like without, I mean, knowing that you're not, you're not talking about these from expertise, but is there anything about those systems that you can like maybe note at all to, to, uh, to anybody who's wondering about them, like in regards to this, I basically just to, just to touch on them since we're here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Chaldean is probably the the other, like I would say Pythagorean and Chaldean um, probably have the most overlap um, because they use similar systems of numbers, even though not all the digits are the same. Um, but some of the number energies of just the building block numbers are pretty similar in Chaldean. Um, but Chinese numerology is really fascinating because the Chinese have this structure of some numbers being lucky or unlucky. And we don't really, in the Western world, we haven't really gone into, um, you know, maybe you don't have a great experience with one number, but we wouldn't collectively call that number like bad or anything. Um, mm -hmm. But the way that they come to the knowledge of whether or not a number is lucky or unlucky has to do with the sound, like the uh, homophones, that the word for the number sounds like other numbers. So for example, we have talked about, I mentioned four, Four is a very unlucky number in Chinese numerology because the word for four sounds like the word for death. So there's like already this superstition Whoa. around four. And actually a friend of mine was uh, working retail and someone came in and said, I see that you have sets of four. Would you be able to break it open? Could I buy three or five? Because I can't gift this person four. That would be like culturally uncouth of me to give wow. this person a set of four, um, which is very funny because in the Western world, a set of four is like very traditional. Like we would, mm. we would definitely buy four. That sounds great. <laughs> um, wow. So yeah. So I find the Chinese system really fascinating. I think what, what that also kind of connects to for me, like we, uh, John was asking or uh, talking earlier there about like, there's some scientists debating whether or not numbers exist, you know, um, and like some say that they do exist and others say that they like exist externally from people. I mean, um, uh, and like, which philosophically I'm fascinated by, but what's also interesting to me is that what that really speaks to is something we kind of connected to earlier about like numbers as context and numbers as, as a way to explore an idea and how like in for that culture, because literally because of their language, because of the words they use for something, it changes how they feel about other things that sound like those things. That's just an interesting, like, it's almost like, like, uh, um, poetry. Like if there was famous poetry that we loved and then the rhyme became so prominent that anything that sounded anything like that, we also associated, you know, there's mm -hmm. kind of an, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm kind of uh, freestyling here. Uh, what was the other thing I was going to mention? Oh, something that you said near the beginning that I think is just interesting is uh, like, so we've been talking about the, the value of numbers and how you like how we feel about them. But then you mentioned like be, uh, near the beginning about how you've been reading tarot for 15 years, which is a crazy number that you didn't want to think about. <laughs> I think that's a that's like. I couldn't not bring up the fact that that's an interesting phrase to use when we're talking about numerology, like yeah. um, that relationship we have to not just like the, those integers that you're talking about, but like, but the way, like why 15 seems like a problem when it's years, but it's fine. Mm. When it's, um, uh, I don't know, um, like leaves on a leaves on a plant. Like, <laughs> yeah. do you know what I mean? Like a... Yeah. Well, and even funnier that I said 15, because in the tarot, the, the 15th card is the devil. So I think there's like, <laughs> there's also some weird, some weird stuff in there. But I think what yeah, you're yeah. talking about is really true and really interesting. There is a new book, maybe I can't remember the name of it now, but somebody's reading it um, that I know that literally is like, why and what is math and like, is math real basically? And so mm -hmm. I am really fascinated um, 
by the current conversations. But I think with numbers and whether they, you know, how we feel about them or, or the associations, something that's interesting is that they are, numbers are a collective unit of measurement. And, but even with within that, like we don't all measure time the same way. And I also think that the idea of measuring time is one of those ineffable things that like, we still don't understand how time works. So to on a practical and then like a woo-woo level, like mm. practically, uh, if you're going to use current yearly cycle numbers, you have to use the calendar you use. So I would use the Gregorian calendar, but maybe you operate on a Jewish calendar. Maybe you operate on another, cal- you know, so the Gregorian calendar was not even, I think this is in the book, was not even adopted um, by certain countries in to like the last five, 10 years. So it mm-hmm. is really wild to kind of think about what we think of as collective and then to realize like, oh, that's not, we don't all use that. Um, so I, so I do think the, that's why I think the conversation's fascinating because if you switch, if you're switching a calendar, you're switching structures, you're getting whole new numbers and all new calculations. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's very practical. On the woo-woo side, if you're thinking about like how we measure time, um, there are two new studies that are really interesting to me. The first is that they've done more researchers are looking into your our personal perceptions of time being connected to our heartbeats. So they're looking at this in terms of mental health and especially ADHD or anxiety, which um, people who who navigate those those um, illnesses, including myself, like we have different perceptions of time than other people. If you get lost in something and (laughs) you come out (laughs) five years later and you're like, oh my gosh, like, and it's actually only been 20 minutes. Um, But it has to do with like your, the speed of your heartbeat actually actually affects your perception of time, Mm. um, which is really interesting. And then The other one is that they have been studying quasars, like universal quasars and light. And from the birth of the universe until now, scientists think that time has actually sped up by one fifth. Wow! So even in that, like they say that looking at some of these long ago light sources that are dead now, but we're still seeing the light, um, they're actually running like slow-mo movies because- speed, like time didn't move mm. as fast when that light first came. I can't even explain this to you, but I'm fascinated. Yeah. So, and time, time moves differently uh, 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 due to gravity as well. So if you're at the, the very top of a high mountain, it's going to be by, you know, fractions of a millisecond of a fraction, but time is going to be different uh, from you at the top of the mountain and people at the bottom of the mountain. Right. Yeah. And of course, you know, yeah. Einstein talking about moving at the speed of light. Time is going to be different. Whoa, man. Sorry, I I know. No, no, that's it though. But it just, yeah. I think the reason that this is coming up is because we were talking, you know, and to like get us back into good old Gnosticism, like we were <laughs> asking about this system, um, if it's archonic or the demiurge in the, in the room. And I think, um, that to me seems to be about authority and control. And so if you're using Mm. this as a tool to understand, not as a system that's telling you something, like it's not Mm -hmm. prescribing you something about yourself. Um, But I think like all of these ideas of like, we're never really going to understand it anyway. So we're kind of just getting closer or peeking through the curtain or chipping away at something. Um, It's just important to my kind of personal ethos whenever I'm teaching this information. Mm. There's um, one thing that this makes me think of uh, is uh, uh, how so many fairy stories involve lost time. Um, mm. so figures who encounter a supernatural experience and maybe go to a different place or or what have you come back and they've lost decades, you know. Um, and even to bring it back to like relativistic physics, um, interstellar involves that. Like they go through a wormhole, they go down to planets that end up eating up a bunch of time. Like, so they go through more time than uh, in the, in the real world or on earth than, ex- than they experience, which to me means that interstellar is a fairy story. Great. They go into well, a fairy circle, they come back out. 
<laughs> is that the next episode of Pop Gnosis? <laughs> Might be. <laughs> Willie, I don't know. I, I think totally Barbie is next. Know. I like your idea oh, yeah. of Barbie. Yeah, it's got to be Barbie. <laughs> yeah. Barbie is next, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, now we've promised it on the show, so uh, now we have to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it for me, John. Yeah, well, everybody go to RebeccaSkolnick.com, uh, buy the book, get the book and the audio book. Uh, the, Rebecca won't make this uh, promise, but talk gnosis will. Buy the book, and you can use numerology to win the lottery. So guaranteed... Uh, if you don't win the lottery for some reason, just email Jason at GnosticWisdom.net uh, <laughs> and we, the, the, our complaints department. Um, and uh, I, really I need will to earn... check that email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, uh, also I'm going to earn my five cents and uh, put these links in the show notes. Uh, and talk about money after you win the lottery, go to uh, paypal.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, you can help keep the show going. Uh, we don't give you anything in return, but um, that's because we don't want to lock stuff up behind a paywall. So we're always trying to think of things that we can do. If you have ideas, feel free to email us. If you want me or Jason to go over to your house and do your dishes, we'll do it. Uh, then we might have some stuff coming down the pipeline. I've been saying that for a while, but I have some ideas. You do get early access to the shows when I remember to send it out. But you get to do you, you get to do a good thing and help us keep the show mm -hmm. going. You can do uh, paypal.me slash Gnostic for, uh, for one-time donations. And uh, I think uh, I, I think that's it. So RebeccaSkolnick.com and uh, B, thanks so much for coming on. Sorry that we took so long to do this, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing your delightful voice in my years uh, reading this book to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for the support. I just really genuinely appreciate the both of you so much, and the fact that you would even want to talk to me about this is great. So um, oh, thanks, everyone, for listening and for keeping open minds, obviously. <laughs> okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.